Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. In this episode, we're going to take a look at a homemade integrating sphere. So let's stick this on the bench and take a look. In a previous video, I was trying to measure dye laser output um, with the Raspberry Pi spectrometer. So I was trying to like measure its uh, wa you know, the, the wavelength range essentially of it. And the way I was doing that was I was pointing the spectrometer and the dye laser at a non-fluorescent target, which comprised of PTFE tape. And in the video, I called it poor man's spectral on, and indeed it is, right? It's 99 odd percent reflective. And it's very, very white and it doesn't fluoresce. It's, it's an almost ideal target. You know, spectral on itself is hundreds to thousands of dollars and so PTFE is a real quick way of, uh, you know, quick and dirty way of uh, building a, a suitable target. Uh, somebody suggested in the comments that a better way of doing that would be to use a, an Ulbricht sphere. And I googled that and it actually turns out that's an integrating sphere. Um, and the way it works is, is really, really cool. If we take a look at the Wikipedia article real quick, it's just basically a hollow cavity that's covered on the inside with a diffuse white reflective coating. Um, and the coating for these things really is the, the secret sauce, but it's not that secret. The stuff's been out for years. Um, so let's look at how it works in practice. Um, if I have a sphere and it's coated, um, you know, let's imagine we coated it with spectral on, on the internal surface. If I shine a laser in here, um, it's going to hit the wall at the far end and then that's going to scatter off in all directions all the way around the sphere and bounce around and bounce around forevermore until finally it finds its way out of the hole, uh, out of the other hole. Um, and we end up with a very, very diffuse uh, field of light. That is very, you know, it should be very, very easy to point a spectrometer at without having to worry about artifacts in the beam or any other weirdness going on. Um, yeah, so that's what I set out to do. We'll take a look at a couple of academic papers really, really quick. Uh, so here's an academic paper um, that was printed by Aberystwyth University where a bunch of undergraduates uh, set out to create a integrating sphere um, for, for you know little price. In fact, if you look up integrating spheres on eBay, they're incredibly expensive. You know, even second hand, you're like $500. And if you want to buy one brand new, um, it'll run into thousands of dollars for what is essentially a hollow ball um, with a layer of paint on it and some holes in the side. Um, so yeah, so it's actually a really, really cool paper. And if we scoop through there, um, we'll see some money shots. So there's a little uh, integrating sphere. There's the 3D thing that they created. There's the model. Um, I think these. I think the 3D uh, model is actually available on the internet. So if any of you guys own a 3D printer and you just want to build an integrating sphere, um, you can just rattle one out on your printers, right? Um, but yeah, some nice little pictures down here. Um, excellent. Uh, the good thing about this paper is it tells you how to make the internal coating. Um, and very, very simply, it's barium sulfate, which you can buy off eBay. Um, you want reasonable, you know, high, pure, uh, high purity barium sulfate, and you mix it with 1% uh, by weight PVA glue, which for US viewers is Elmer's glue, right? It's just wood glue. Um, mix it in with a bit of water and maybe a little bit of alcohol to aid um, evaporation and just spray it on the inside surface of your sphere and you are literally done. Um, they came out with a figure of a reflectance of between 90 and 95%, which depends on the wavelength of light. It's mostly flat across the, you know, it's, it's mostly got a relatively flat response curve, but it's a little less uh, reflective in the blue than it is in the red. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. Incidentally, barium sulfate is the same compound that was used in the world's whitest paint uh, that was produced by a university in the States. I think they were using it to try and cool buildings without having to spend money on air conditioning uh, by painting roofs with like super, super white paint. Um, and this is exactly the stuff that was used in there. Um, yeah, barium sulfate is the answer. It's, it's often used in um, uh, diffuse reflectors inside of lasers for flash lamp pump lasers um, as, they, as, as the diffuse reflector around the cavity. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. And the paper's well, well worth a read. Um, this is the paper and I'll, I'll link these things down below. I'll maybe put in the DOI number or whatever, but this is the, uh, the academic paper. Um, for the ultra white paint that they were using to cool buildings, um, which makes for a very interesting read as well. Um, yeah, pretty cool stuff. Um, I, I suppose, you know, we could, we could spend maybe um, an hour and a half talking about paint formulations for things. It's actually quite an interesting topic. Um, I never thought that it'd be anything that I would be particularly interested in, but um, suddenly I have a need for an, an ultra white flat paint. Uh, so there we are. 
just to finish off there I mentioned before that you know this isn't some kind of magic formula I mean barium sulfate has been in use since at least 1981 according to this paper um, as a reflectance standard and it actually compares it here you know a 500 gram bottle of barium sulfate costs 25 bucks um, whereas spectralon you know, given that this is an old paper as well um, easily nearly nearly 400 bucks right um, so you know if you're interested in doing like homemade optics and you really can't afford to shell out for spectralon and you want something super white and super high reflectance and super diffuse um, then barium sulfate is absolutely the way to go for this. So as I've said before, the paint mixture is a not so secret sauce and it's very, very easy to buy the ingredients. I have here a big bag of barium sulfate that I got off eBay very, very cheaply. Um, you know, 97%, which is close enough for me. And I've also got PVA glue. Um, as I said before, it's uh, Elmer's glue in the States. It's the glue that children can eat and it won't kill them. Um, so this is my integrating sphere. Um, when I wanted to build a sphere, I didn't want to have to turn one on the lathe. Um, I, you know, I did want something made out of metal so it was good and heavy and would sit on my bench. Um, but I did a little bit of shopping looking for ball moulds and apparently cannonball moulds are a thing, even in the UK. Um, so I've got a cannonball mould made of brass. Um, I've turned off the ends, on, you know, faced the ends in the lathe there because they had attachments for handles. Widened out the port that you would um, pour lead into and then drilled another port on the other side painted the whole thing flat black. On the inside I've got my coating and as you can see it's incredibly white um, it really really is very very white. Um, I tried this in a spray gun to begin with but managed to gum the thing up. Um, the, the barium sulfate particles are really quite large um, even after you know pulverizing them in a, in a pestle and mortar but um, so what I did was cheated. Um, I just mixed it up with a little tiny paintbrush and just stippled it on there and did several coats over several days until I'd built up a nice thick coating. If we shine a laser pointer at it, we can see it illuminates um, you know, half of this, this entire hemisphere here quite easily. We'll try it with a violet laser pointer just because we can. Excellent. Um, yeah, if I reassemble it and we point the laser pointer into one of the ports there, We can see that we've got a really, really nice diffuse output that we can uh, that we can point the spectrometer at. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I'll just try it with a violet laser pointer as well, so we can see that. Yeah, so we've got this really, really nice diffuse target to look at. Excellent. So um, let's set, let's set up an experiment. Fire this on the bench. We all want to see what this will do with lasers, right? So uh, let's do that. So I have the homemade integrating sphere set up on my optical bench here and into it I'm directing the light from two lasers as a quick test. I've got a 632.8 nanometer helium neon laser that lasers in the red and I have a 561 nanometer yellow green laser that's pointing into the sphere. We can see that the output of the sphere is very very uniform. It's a nice uniform field that we can easily point the spectrometer at. And I'm using a, a small mirror mount here to direct the light towards the front of the Raspberry Pi spectrometer. If you've not seen the Raspberry Pi spectrometer before, I will link in that video down below. Definitely check that out. It's a really, really cool project. Let's take a look at the software real quick and see what we're looking at here. Um, we can clearly see two clearly defined peaks in the graph window down at the bottom. And we can see from the live video image at the top there that we've completely and utterly minimized any sort of speckle that we were getting before. We can move the spectrometer side to side within you know, a couple of degrees and uh, everything is still just peachy, which is absolutely fantastic. This was exactly what I was looking for, something that was very, very easy to point at laser spots, as it were, uh, without, uh, without having to you know, adjust things by the micron to try and get the, the you know, maximum light from the laser output into the spectrometer itself. Absolutely fantastic. So what I'll do now is rearrange things on the bench. We'll set up the dye laser. We'll do a quick test of the spectrum from it and see how well this performs. Uh, but so far, so good. So I have set up here a dye laser that's been pumped by a nitrogen laser. Uh, both of these lasers are featured in other videos. I'll link them in down below if you want to see them. Um, but yeah, in the uh, dye curvette itself, I have Kamarin 1, which will laze everywhere from about 490 odd nanometers um, all the way, quite, quite ways down into the blue. So it'll go blue to, to blue-green, almost to the green um, as its tuning range. And we're bouncing this off two mirrors here into the homemade integrating sphere and then pointed at the aperture of the integrating sphere i've got my homemade raspberry pi spectrometer and which i'll also link in down below if you're new to this channel uh, but let's have a look at the software and see what we can see and um, we can see a nice little peak at 495 nanometers right on the very edge of blue green 
Um, yeah, excellent. Because this is a pulse laser, we'll hit peak hold, and then we'll just have a quick tune through the tuning range. So I've got to tune relatively slowly because it is pulse and I don't want to leave too many gaps in the plot that we get. But now we're going quite a ways down into the blue. And then deep blue. Nice. Um, this is working out really, really well. Let me just turn off peak hold a minute. Um, yeah, the, the whole purpose of doing this was to produce a nice wide area that I could point the spectrometer at. And if I move it from side to side, even a couple of degrees, um, we can see that there's not much change in the output there. Um, absolutely fantastic. I've lost it now. Oh, easy. Just point it back at the source and we're done. Um, with, a, with a laser beam, a raw beam on a target, this is a real pain in the backside. Um, so to be able to just basically chuck stuff down on the bench and have things kind of work is really, really nice. Um, while we're about it, we'll just swap out the dies for uh, Rhodamine 6G, which is tunable from green to yellow. And we'll just give that a quick tune as well. So I've just loaded, just loaded Rhodamine 6G into the die laser there and we'll begin the tuning process. So let's hit peak hold and tune all the way through and see what we get. Again, I'm kind of rushing with this, but it'll be good enough for this video. Awesome. Um, so yeah, there's the complete tuning range of Rotoming 6G. And once again, really, really easy to set up, really, really easy to point the spectrometer at our source now. Um, has to be said, um, out of all the projects I've done, this is probably one of the easiest, and then at the same time, one of the most useful in terms of being able to measure things in a sensible way. Absolutely fantastic. Thanks for watching this episode of Les's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys next time.